many, many years. Uh, he's a man of God. He's got a call to be a pastor. He's solid in the Word of God. And he's a good friend. And uh, I like it when we meet because I get to eat lunch. Sometimes I don't get to eat lunch, but I go and meet him for lunch, and we have a good time of fellowship. And uh, I want him to come this morning, take his liberty, um, and introduce his fiance to us because I'm sure we want to welcome her into the family. Amen. And uh, we are family, right? We're family. We're washed in the blood of the Lamb, and we're family. And uh, it's a it's a privilege and honor. He was at my ordination service, and uh, he was a real blessing in my life. His dad was a real blessing in my life, still is, and he's a man of God, and I appreciate him and uh, the Monroe family and the Faith Tabernacle Church. And uh, I'm just so glad that he's here today to share the word of God. And I want you to come, brother, take your liberty in the Lord. Now, I want, I want you to understand. Now, I, see, he, he pastored a, think about this, he pastored a Baptist church for seven years. I think it was a Baptocostal church. But, you know, he pastored a church there for seven years as a senior pastor. And I just want you to know, brother, this morning, please lean more to the Pentecostal side. <laughs> Take your liberty. This is not 25 minutes. Take your liberty and serve the Lord, okay? Just speak what he said. All right, I think I'm on. i get this stuff over with. All right. It's good to be with you all. Uh, definitely Pastor Bob and Linda have been a blessing in my life over the years, and uh, you've been there as an encouragement and support, so I'm thankful for you both and your church. Many of you have come to know a little bit more, and I uh, appreciate you. Yes, I am engaged. Uh, met Megan back in January, and uh, from there, I chased her for about a month and a half, <laughs> maybe two months. Finally, got her to go on a date with me, and... Uh, Engaged, so. No, she didn't run very fast. <laughs> <laughs> but she kind of did, but <laughs> she wasn't looking for anybody, and neither was, neither was I, so I guess it was good timing. So, If you have your Bibles, let's get down to what we're here for. Psalm chapter 88. Psalm chapter 88. I love the Psalms. Uh, we find so much in them regarding truth, regarding how Human beings in their struggles look towards God. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, oh, is there a thing a little more we can start here while you're turning there? <clears throat> you have to love the allergies, right? <laughs> All right, so Psalm chapter 88. Let's read through that and this is what we'll be looking into today, and then we're going to pray and uh, get into this. O oh Lord, God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before Thee. Let my prayer come before Thee. Incline Thine ear unto my cry, for my soul is full of troubles. My life draweth nigh unto the grave. I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that hath no strength. Free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit in darkness and in the depths. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Thou hast put away mine acquaintance from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up, I cannot come forth. Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee. I have stretched out my hands unto thee. Though thou show wonders to the dead, shall the dead rise and praise thee? Selah. Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave, or thy faithfulness in destruction? Shall thy wonders be known in the dark, and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But unto thee I cry, O Lord. In the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. Lord, why castest thou off my soul? 
Why hidest thou my face, uh, thy face from me? I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up while I suffer. Thy terrors I am distracted. Thy fierce wrath goeth over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. Thou came around about me daily like water. Thou can pass me about together. Lover and friend thou hast put far from me and my acquaintance into darkness. I like to speak on the subject of when life hurts. When life hurts. Let's pray. Father, I ask that your anointing would be upon me, that your Holy Spirit would illuminate the truths of your word, that it would come forth with that touch that only you can give, that unction that only comes from you. I'm not looking to rely upon intelligence, but the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. There are 150 Psalms in the Bible. And Psalm 88 is probably the saddest of all the Psalms. It's a Psalm that I think many Christians are not even too aware of. We tend to turn to those Psalms that bring more comfort to us or more familiarity, Psalm 3, 23, and so forth. But yet, this Psalm stands out to me And as I studied it, my heart was so moved by it because I can identify with the writer. Now, maybe today you are having a good day. Maybe you're having a bad day. Maybe you're going through some hard times. Maybe you're going through some really hard times. We're all in different places. But I think we can all get some things from this great text today as we look into it. Verse 15 is a key verse in this chapter. It says, I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up while I suffer thy terrors. I am distracted. So it is believed that this man's problem stemmed from his youth. And it may have even been leprosy. Leprosy during that time frame was an incurable disease that from the inside out just destroyed the human body. It brought about shame. It brought about a sense of this isolation from people and even a thinking in one's mind that maybe God would be separate from me. So as we look into this and we go deeper, we find that this writer believes he has no future. I mean, look at verses 3 through 4. I have, it says here, For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. I am count with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that hath no strength. You know, here's what begins to happen with us when we go through difficult times. We sort of can sometimes take on this perspective of gloom and doom and sort of a negative kind of idea in our mind. And that's what's happening with this man. He says he believes in his heart there's no future. He believes he has no friends. Uh, look at verse number 8 with me. That was put away my acquaintance from me, far from me. So he, he, he doesn't feel he has friends. He feels like he's all alone. All alone is what demonic powers of darkness can really seize you and move upon you and try to distract you, defeat you, discourage you. Isolation is where he'd like you to be. Recently I've faced some challenges myself and Pastor Bob said to me, be careful with isolation. We have to be very careful because... The demonic powers of darkness look for vulnerability. And where you're vulnerable is where he can begin to operate. He believes he has no foundation. He has no faith. We even see from verse 13, look with me for a moment. But unto thee I have cried, O Lord, in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. He feels that God isn't answering his prayers. He doesn't really have... An explanation for his problems. Have you ever been there where you don't really have an explanation for your problems? It's just hard to see clearly, right? So life has become one of misery for this follower of God. Misery. Okay? So life has become so difficult. So what do you do when life becomes difficult? That's the question, really. Because life will become difficult. Jesus talked about one house built on the sand and one built upon the rock. He said the storm came to both. There's no running from the storm. The storm comes to both. But the question is, what is the foundation 
spiritually speaking, you have in your life because the storms will come. We're promised that. Firstly, maintain your connection to God. Maintain your connection to God. This man kept on praying. Look at verse 2. For I have said, mercy shall be... Uh, sorry, verse 2. Let my prayer come before thee. Incline thy ear unto my cry. So he keeps crying out to God, seeking God, pursuing God, turning to God. He keeps that connection alive. You see, what the devil would love to happen is he'd love for us to become stagnant and begin to drift away from turning to God, communicating with God, opening our heart to God, giving the Holy Spirit access to move in our lives. That's what he would love to do, to get us discouraged to the point where we're no longer praying, we're no longer reading the Bible, we're no longer opening our hearts to God, and we're letting the storms of life beat on us and beat on us and beat on us, and we're just becoming more distant from God because He is our strength, He is our hope, He is all that we have to make it through the storms and the struggles of life. Human reason cannot do it. Only God moving into the human soul. I love to study of politics, and I'm an intellectual. I enjoy listening to all the aspects of uh, intellectual support for our faith. I believe in all that. I believe that the Bible shows its evidence not only through what it does to our hearts, but prophecy and, and through archaeology and through all the different aspects that we can study. But what it comes down to most of all, the Holy Spirit must go to that place where only He can go and have access to our hearts and touch us. And that's where we are changed forever is in that place. So He keeps praying crying out to God. And it says in Romans 12.12, 12, continue in instant prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. And we begin to understand as we grow in our faith that prayer is more than a posture. Prayer is more than a, a certain way of doing things. It's a lifestyle. We were constantly connected to God. You may not be able to talk to God on your job, but you can keep your heart open to God. You see, sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Allowing the Holy Spirit to have access and to work and to move and to convict and to encourage and to show us what it is that He desires in our life. There are times where I begin to go astray and I just step back and I just let the Holy Spirit illuminate my heart and mind. And all of a sudden I realize there's something wrong or maybe I'm becoming discouraged or whatever it could be going on in our hearts. The demonic powers of darkness wants us to stop opening our hearts to God. And then it becomes hard. Hard. And then his voice becomes distant. And then we have one, we have two natures, a new nature and an old nature. And the old nature begins to take over the new nature. And it leads to more suffering. Because sin with its beauty, as it appears to be beauty, always has its suffering with it. Secondly, here, he prays emotionally. I love this. Look at verse 1 with me. O Lord, God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before you. Uh, Pastor Langevin was talking about being Pentecostal. And one of the things I appreciate about it, my grandfather, my mom's father was Pentecostal, is that it was more than just intellect. It was something from the depth of our being that we knew that we needed the touch of God that we couldn't just have words on a paper or a sermon that came structured just perfectly. We needed God to breathe His life upon us. And the Holy Spirit talks about the quickening of His Holy Spirit where He touches us and makes us alive and active and does in two seconds what cannot be done in hours of learning. We must keep our hearts and minds, our church, uh, prayer lives open to the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. He cries out from the depths of his soul. And I'm here to tell you, it's not so much praying perfectly, but it's praying in an authentic way. It's praying in such a way that we begin to say, God Almighty, touch my heart. Move on my behalf. Work in my life. I cannot leave here until you do something, Father. Sometimes that's the prayer that captures the heart of God. So... Human emotions, human emotions seem to touch the heart of God. The compassion of Jesus is amazing, 
And as you look into the compassion of Jesus as he walked this earth, different times in the Gospels, it would say that he was moved with compassion. And as you go into the Greek word, it, it really unfolds a deeper meaning that those with the, who interpret it into the English struggle to try to understand. But it's just in the inner part of Jesus' being, it was rocked to such a degree that his inner parts were so moved with compassion towards people that it actually was this shaking, this inward powerful sense of emotion within him. And much of his miracles flowed from this place of great compassion. And it says in Hebrews, and I love this, that we have a Savior who is touched with our infirmities. He knows all that we're going through. Not only does he know about it, but he feels our pain. He feels our hurt. He feels our loneliness. He connects so deeply with us. You may feel like you're such a million miles away from God, or you're separate from people, or you're not one of his special ones. I'm here to tell you he created you with a purpose he created you. He knows every detail of your life, every sin in your life, every struggle in your life. And he desires to move into your life and to change you and to transform you right now in this moment. He will meet you where you're at no matter what, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've been through. God is filled with compassion for us. The heart of Christ is displayed with one that is moved with compassion. Yes, he is holy. But he's also compassionate. So, also he prays intelligently. How many know there's nothing wrong with using our minds? Okay, verse 1. O Lord, God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. We're going to unpack this. We're going to look into this for a moment. Because we see Lord, and, and we kind of get this uh, sort of a, a weak understanding of the word Lord being in the English language. As you go deeper it was Jehovah, which refers to God as the covenant keeper. That's the interpretation that the, the psalmist, we can draw from it, that he's saying, God, you're the God who made a covenant with Israel. You made a covenant with us that you will work on our behalf, and you are faithful, you are true, you are almighty. Nothing can stop you or hinder you from keeping your word on our behalf. You are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then we move into the New Testament, and God got tired of making covenants with people. And he says, I'm going to make a covenant with my son, Jesus. And this is a covenant that will not, cannot be broken by no demonic powers of hell, which would make the uh, Apostle Paul step forth and declare with great confidence, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Why? Because God made a covenant with his son Jesus. And in that covenant, it was sealed forever. Hallelujah. He's reminded the writer of who God is. Sure, his understanding of God wasn't as extensive as our understanding of God. His understanding of God was a little bit more limited than ours. But he had some understanding of God. He's a God that is faithful and true and just, who never changes. The steadfast is Steadfast love of the Lord never changes. Everything about us is unstable. The world's unstable. Our problems, our lives are so moving in different directions. That's why so many people that are apart from God are, are going in different directions. It's confused and emotional and, and, and different directions, bound by sin, bound by that. And they say, well, we're having a great time. But when something holds you captive, you're not really truly having a great time. And so you have all these different things going on. Why? Because we need stability as human beings, and only one stability has God Almighty. He says, Jehovah, the one who keeps his covenant. Maintain your connection to God. And then secondly, this is the hard part, folks. Please hear me. This is the part where many of us begin to go astray. Maintain your commitment to God. Maintain your commitment to God. You see, this is the hard part right here. Look at verse 14. Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Why hidest thou thy face from me? And he asks the question here, but he's still committed to following God. He's still committed to doing what God asks. You see, it's easy to do what God asks when we feel good. When things are going well, right? And then in the Pentecostal, if we're not careful, we focus too much on emotions so we're feeling the presence of God. Oh, I can, I can do, go out and I can do these different things God wants me to do. I feel confident. But sometimes God feels distant. Sometimes God 
doesn't answer prayer. I've heard the analogy said by a pastor who had three kids, and I loved it because he had three kids, and one of them came and said, can I have some Coke? And he said, no, it's 10 o'clock, uh, 9 o'clock at night, whatever it is. You're not having Coke. Another one came and said, can I have uh, grapes? Yes. Another one said, well, can I go swimming? He says, later. He says, God answers us three ways. Yes, no, later. But he answers us. His silence is an answer. And so we sometimes want to, you know, intellectualize everything. But we have to realize that we have to maintain our commitment to him and realize that we are following God. And though we don't feel good, though life gets hard and difficult, though there are times that we feel so cast off from God and distant from God. He is still working on our behalf. His promises haven't changed. His call hasn't changed. His hand upon our life, His blessings. You see, we are blessings and our, our mindset is so distorted. And what the enemy wants to do is keep us in this tunnel, so to speak, where we can only see partially. I've heard the example of someone surveying the land from the land, looking out. They get a certain view. But the first time in the helicopter gets a better view. We need to be in the helicopter, folks, because you know something? The breath that we breathe is a gift from Almighty God. The fact that I have hands that move and feet that move, I am blessed beyond measure. I got food in my stomach. I even went to Dunkin' Donuts this morning and had a coffee. You know, I am blessed beyond measure. But you know something? We get so caught up into this negative, depressed, what the things are not going my direction and things are not going my way. And, you know, we, in, in our culture, in the church world in America, we're so spoiled. We're so, we're so pampered in so many ways. And God, in the midst of it all, is calling us to a deeper walk. I remember I went to spend a month in the Philippines. I can relate to what you were saying this morning. It was, it was tough. Sleeping in a bamboo hut at one point, lies, you know, it was brutal. And the missionary brought me to different churches to preach. And one church I went to, I'll never forget, no walls had some kind of ceiling, and these rocks with a piece of wood across the rocks. I mean, I, I grew up as a pastor's kid. I heard complaining about chairs, and it's too cold, and it's too this, and it's too long, and where's that, and where's this? And I, I grew up with all that stuff. And so, and so for me, it was amazing to watch these people as they came into the service, and they're worshiping God. At one point, they're singing that song, Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. And I'm thinking to myself, what do these folks have to give thanks about? I mean, I was only like 20 years old. And so I was like, what do I even preach to these people? I, I didn't even feel worthy to get up and speak to them. Who am I to speak to them? But then that verse came in the mind from Philippians where it said, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, right? Do not robbery to be equal. God took the form of a servant. Christ, from the moment he came into this earth as a human, never ceasing to be God, suffered. And I knew there was one who could relate to them, and that was Jesus. I couldn't relate to them, but Jesus could relate to them. So we want to understand that our thinking sometimes is the problem. And our thinking can cause us, if I can just move this over here. Actually, I don't want to do that, but hold on. You need one of those stands, uh, Pastor Bob, over here for the water. I don't know. <laughs> so God says, I am working on your behalf. I have a plan. I am not changing. So sometimes we just got to reach deep and trust in God. So regardless how life appears, and life will appear in different ways for us, God is still working, right? So it says here, and I'm just going to give you a little outline of him quickly, if you just bear with me. Verse 6 says, he laid me in the darkest pit. Verse 6, in darkness. Also it says, in the depths, they laid, that thy wrath lieth hard, afflicted me with all thy ways. You see, that's the complexion that uh, he comes up with, the perspective, rather, that he comes up with. And so in this perspective he's at, okay, if that's the end of the story, folks, we might as well just give up, right? Right? Because, see, life is broken. Broke, this world became broken when sin came into it in the Garden of Eden. Everything changed. God had two human beings walking with him with a divine connection, with no separation, uh, complete paradise, no suffering, no pain, no sorrow, no tears. Everything was perfect. Human beings messed it up. Sin came into the world. Now we have a broken world. That's not God's fault. But we are in a broken world. And suffering will be here. Struggle will be here. Different things will happen that I don't fully understand. But in the midst of it all, and I love this, we have a hope. 
that a God is working on our behalf. And he promises that one day he'll wipe away all tears. One day he will make things right. Not only in our heart, but in this world. And there will be no more tears or suffering or pain or sorrow. And that's for all eternity. He says, I need you to endure this life for a short period of time. And then the next life will be forever. And when you get a heaven perspective, it helps your earthly perspective get a little bit easier. And so he knew in his heart there was something much more beyond what the temporal showed him. That there's a purpose in all of this. That God was working on our behalf. I also like to point out to you that God is not afraid of the wise. He's not afraid of the questions and the doubts and the, and the concerns and the honesty. Because see, I really think what God wants is honesty. God desires honesty, and he will move in our life sometimes in such a way to bring us to the point where we're more, more authentic and more honest before him and transparent before him because he'd rather deal with the real us. It says in the book of Genesis that when Jacob was left alone, an angel came, and they wrestled with that angel. And so we, we were left alone, and when he can get a little hold of us in an authentic, real, transparent way, then real change can happen. As long as we're doing the Christian robot thing, and we're experts at it, aren't we? Some of us have been serving God for a long time. God is good. I will make it. God will bring a way. God will make a way. There is no way. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. And sometimes God just says, get on your knees before me and seek me. Open your heart before me. Pour it out before me. There are times in my life where I've shed tears, and I've just got to that point where I've said, God Almighty, work in my life. Change my heart. There's sometimes revival won't take place to people start getting broken and desperate before a holy God and not satisfy where you are because satisfaction is, is, is so destructive at times because it takes us away from what God desires, dependency upon Him. And God wants us 100% dependent on Him and he will orchestrate sometimes the events of life to get us dependent on him. This, this, this writer of this psalm sort of saw God as, as giving forth his wrath. But really what God seemed to be doing was working on his behalf to get him to connect with God himself in a deeper way. He will work the events of his life. Let me tell you something. The hurt from people the struggles from people, the difficulties from people, the problems in your life can be used for good purposes. To bring out things in you. I used to wonder, why does God test us? He knows everything, right? He's not surprised when we mess up. But he wants to show us what's in us. He wants us to let us know that, hey, look, there's some things in your life I've got to work on. There's some things in your life I've got to change. Or maybe there's some things in your life you're doing well, and I want to encourage you with that. So we go through the test and we make it through it. And maybe we don't go through it as bad as it did once before in the past. And God says, look it, you're making progress. I'm working on your behalf. Your gold trod in the fire. But I have a plan. It's a good plan. I'm a good father. And I will take you through it. Jesus said, I will never leave you or Hallelujah. And let me just say, and I'm going to be clear, because I have to be clear, because sometimes people misunderstand me when I preach, and I don't like that. So I do the best I can to be clear. God calls us to live a holy life. God calls us to grow in Him. With that being said, if you wake up in the morning looking for joy based on your performance, you're going to be disappointed. Because none of us are perfect. None of us have it all together. Some people are better at looking like they have it all together. right? Some people are better at hiding their stuff and then judging other people who aren't as good at hiding their stuff. But the reality is we all have stuff. We all have problems. We all have difficulties. So when I wake up in the morning, the only reason I can be happy is because I know Jesus died upon the cross for my sins, rose again, and has sealed me by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's not based on my performance, even though it influences my performance. It's not based on my performance. It's based on all that Jesus Christ did for me and for you. Hallelujah to the Lamb forever. Maintain your commitment to Him. I'm telling you, sometimes we've got to fake it till we make it. What do you mean? 
The Apostle Paul says, rejoice to the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. Right? Rejoice. And we look at that rejoice and we think, well, it's a feeling, you know? Then you go into the Greek, it's a verb. It has to do with this action. It's a decision that we make to rejoice in the Lord. And eventually our feelings catch up. Isn't that interesting? So sometimes I don't feel like worshiping. Sometimes I don't feel like praying. Sometimes I don't even feel like reading my Bible. You know, but sometimes we have to say, you know something, I need to pray. I need to read my Bible. I need to go to church. Sometimes in our culture today, people say stuff like, oh, I'll try to be there. You probably won't then. I find it's amazing today as a pastor just trying to get people to go to church. You know, well, I got this coming up. I'm not sure if I can make it. You can't afford not to make it. Your soul will become more and more disconnected from God if you separate from others. You say, well, I can pray. Yes, God meant us to have a personal prayer life. He also meant us to have a public prayer life and to be connected to other believers and to actually have a pastor. There are some people today that don't think they even need a pastor. Well, I don't really need a pastor. Well, the Bible you're reading says you do. We need accountability. We need encouragement. We even need correction sometimes. We need all those things. So maintain your connection to God. Maintain your commitment to God. And then lastly, maintain your celebration of God. And I love this right here. Because he says, God of my salvation, in verse 1. He's still rejoicing. He's still praising. He hasn't lost that sense of spontaneity, that sense of happiness, that sense of joy, that sense of God's going to play and he's good. And he could sense in his language that there is pain suffering, sorrow, but there also is in the middle of that a sense of exaltation towards God. God is going to take care of things. And he's worshiping God, honoring God, not because things are going well, but because God is well. One person said, God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. What a statement to the world it is when we find satisfaction and joy in our God. No matter what happens, no matter what we go through or face. So maintain your celebration of God. Know that God will take you through. God will move on your behalf. That God has all things under control. I would use the word determine. You have to have some determination in life. Okay? Because if you don't, you'll be tossed to the left and to the right. You'll be as confused as uh, one guy used to say is a termite and a yo-yo. Okay, you'll be very confused and frustrated and angry and, and, and confused and uh, depressed and oppressed and everything else if you have no sense of, of just knowing that God has a plan and following it and seeing it through. So you've got to be determined in your heart and know that you can make it through all of this, that God will take you through all things. Let's get into this, verse 11. Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave or thy faithfulness in destruction? Do you notice he never questions God's faithfulness? He doesn't question that. He's just questioning what it is in a sense of that like God has in his life. Again, you know, be real, be honest, be transparent. As one writer said, Philip Yancey, God, Jesus wasn't looking for the good people. He was looking for the real people, the honest, the authentic, the real. And it says... 14, Lord, why hast thou castest thou off my youth, while hideth thy face from me? It was the experience that he was going through. But here's the key, folks. His experience wasn't his reality. The reality was God had a plan. God was working. God was figuring things out in his path. Okay? There's no mention of him being in sin in a way that's, uh, you know, destructive. You know, he's just following God, going through a difficult time. He's going through affliction of some kind, physical suffering of some kind. So we don't have any of that in here. So what's happening in here is that he has a certain perspective, but you see, he has to adjust that perspective to God's perspective. Okay? Because when you live in your own perspective, that will vary because there's a way that seems was right unto a man and the end leads to death. So we know we need God's perspective to illuminate and to touch and to move on our behalf because we are limited as human beings. What is God doing in your life? What is God speaking in your life? What is God saying to you right now in this moment? C.S. Lewis, the great intellectual writer, said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our, count, our conscience, rather, but shouts 
in our pains. It is a megaphone to arouse a deaf world. You know, suffering can serve a great purpose. We may not understand it. I was listening to someone yesterday that said how pride has two manifestations. One is the outward, which is, I got it all together. I can figure this out. I'm in control. I got, this, I got things going the way I want them to go. I was never blessed with that, okay? I never had it, okay? Cockiness doesn't suit well with me. So you can ask my fiance. She'll just say, knock it off. That's ridiculous, okay? I'm just, uh, I am confident, but I'm a nice guy. I'm a nice guy. So, okay, so where am I going with this? There's two aspects of pride. The confident, outgoing, over-the-top pride. But then there's another kind of pride, which is this, woe is me. I'm going through a difficult time. Uh, things aren't going my way. Things aren't going the way that I feel they should go. That's my kind of pride. You see? It's about me. It's about me. All my struggles. God says, wake up. Look to me. Remember Jonah, right, under the tree, complaining that God had mercy on some people? I can preach a message on that, how you want grace for some people, but not other people. That's another story. But anyways, Jonah's under the tree, and he's sitting there, and he's like, oh, man. How many know that's pride? So, you know, God understands where you're at, what you're going through. And I want to encourage you. You know, just think about the points that I made this morning. Keep going forward. Stay commitment, committed. Remember your connection to God. And remember to keep worshiping Him. Those three things will take you through the fire. And I'm going to end with this last thing. I promise I'll end. I joked about before. My dad has like a thousand closes into his message. I'm closing. Then 20 minutes later, he's still preaching. I won't do that to you. I promise. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in the fiery furnace, all bound up. That's what it describes in the book of Daniel. But you know what's interesting? It's in the fire that they were loosed. The bonds. There are some things in your life that are only going to happen in the fire. And it can't happen any other way. But in the fire. In the purification. In the gold tried by fire, as Jesus says in the book of Revelation. That's the only place it can happen. Now, I faced some challenges recently in my life, and I've done my speculation and questioning, and why is this that way, God, and why can't things go so smooth? But now I'm like, okay, God, you're in control. I'm going to follow whatever you have here. Just show me the way. You know, I'm tired of trying to be in control. It's tiresome, really, isn't it? Let God be in control. It's his job, not mine, right? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I know there are people here that are going through struggles of some kind, problems, turmoil, difficulty. But in the midst of it all, you're calling to their hearts here and now. You know everything about their lives, the failures, the sin, the past, the ups and downs, their half-hearted commitment at times, and my half-hearted commitment at times. You see every detail the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yet, in the midst of it all, you're a Savior who calls to us and says, come walk with me. I'll forgive you. I will heal you. I will change you. Come be with me. I believe there's some here, Father, you're calling back to your heart. Lord, they've become disconnected from you in some kind of way. You're calling them back. There are some here, I believe, that are struggling with a sense of discouragement, which will lead eventually to depression if they don't face the discouragement and deal with it your way. I believe there's some here that may be bound by a certain sin or sins that you want to free them from because you don't want your children bound by anything. I believe, Lord, in the midst of this right now, there's people struggling with the fact that they have unanswered prayers, that life isn't going the way they hoped it would go. But in the midst of it all, I pray they would adjust their perspective to your perspective. We thank you, Lord, that you haven't given up on us. We thank you that you're faithful and you're good and you're just and you're righteous and you're holy and yet you are everlasting to everlasting. You never give up on your children that have humbled their hearts before you. 
We thank you for that, Lord. We rejoice in you. We trust in you. We glorify you. And we magnify you. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. Good word, amen? Amen. One scripture that stood out to me as he was talking is verse 14. I just want to comment real quick on that. Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Why hidest thou thy face from me? Now that word face, as you all know, is an anthropomorphic expression. God doesn't have a face. He doesn't have literal hands and feet and all that. His face that's mentioned here, I believe, is his identity. That's how you identify somebody is through the face. You have a thousand people with the same color hair, same height, all facing backwards. You can't identify them. And I believe what the psalmist is saying here is, is that why have you hid your face, your identity from me? But what identity? What part of his identity is love and care? As a father. When we go through things, sometimes, and really, we've all said this, God, where are you? God, do you still love me? And I tell people all the time, you can question whether God's love you, but don't believe that he doesn't love you. Because God, back in history, showed that he loved us by sending his son. But God so loved the world that he gave his son. Now, we can question it during the times of trials and testings, but we don't have to believe that he has. Amen? So sometimes when we're going through these things, as Pastor had expounded so beautifully, that we think that whatever we're going through for that moment, that, that one thing that, God, I thought you were faithful. How many are waiting on God for something? You've been praying and waiting on God, and it's like taking forever. Well, God... I thought you were faithful. I, I just feel like you're not being faithful to me because this thing hasn't happened yet. Well, God has an, his identity in being faithful shouldn't be questioned because he is faithful. But we can feel that way sometimes. And as Pastor said, it's not for us to go by our feelings and our emotion, but it's to go based upon the truth of what God says who he is in his word. And so I want to challenge you to get really in-depth in, in understanding the uh, attributes of God and who he is. Yes, you know, there are those that walk around like they're, they know it all. But then there are those who know their God and do exploits. There are those that are confident, have been through the fire, have been through the flood, have been through the things that in life, have been have been talked about, have been ridiculed, have been mocked, have been uh, stabbed in the back, if you will. And yet they still keep going on. And they don't have bitterness. They don't have a root of unforgiveness. They don't have any of those things. And the reason why is because they know they are God. They know that if they want their prayers answered, they've got to be right with God. They know that if you want to be forgiven, you've got to forgive. Because without forgiving others, you cannot be forgiven. Come on, that's basic 101 Christianity. And so uh, whenever I read stuff like that and I say, Lord, what, what is the thing, what is the one thing that in my life that you want to identify with? You want me to show you what it is. Show me what it is. And he will. If he'll do it for me, he'll do it for you. That's called walking with God. And I believe that in these last days, Pastor, as the Bible says, when the rapture comes, I hope you still believe in the rapture. Amen. I mean, there's a lot of pastors today don't believe in the rapture. There's a lot of churches don't preach about the rapture. I do. I believe we're going to go in the rapture. <clears throat> but I believe there's a key to that. And I believe that when, that when it happens, I believe God's going to send his son Jesus back. And I take it from the Old Testament when it says, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. I believe that's how it's going to happen. It's going to be that quick. It's going to be that fast. But Enoch walked with God, and then he was not. So 
just continue walking with God. You're going to stumble along the way. You may, you may even twist an ankle along the way. You may even get a little hurt along the way. But always remember this one thing, that God is in favor of you. That's what grace is, God's favor. He's favoring you to continually understand and know his identity of who he is, not only in this world, but who he is to you as a person. That's why it's a personal salvation. Amen? Let's give a good God bless you to our pastor. Amen. God bless you, brother. It's good to have you with us. And um, shall we all stand in closing this morning? Praise the Lord. Pray for those you don't see this morning that should be here. Pray for them. You know, if you don't see them here, give them a call. We, uh, the Condi family, give them a call. Others that are maybe missing this morning, give them a call this morning. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We give you the glory, the honor, and all the praise this morning in every aspect of the service this morning. Father, without you, we can do nothing. We can't praise you. We can't do anything. We can't sing. We can't glorify you because, Lord, it is your presence. It is you that we long for. It is you that we need in our lives. So, Father, I pray that you bless their going in, their coming out, their lying down, their rising up. I pray, Father God, that you will speak to them and fellowship with them this week. And, Lord, as we get together tomorrow for prayer, I pray that you bring all of those that need to be here for prayer tomorrow night. Father, for Wednesday night Bible study, as we, we learn how to interpret the Bible and the tools that you have allowed us to, to be able to uh, obtain to do that, as our brother says, we need the Holy Ghost, but we also need our minds. God wants us to use our minds. And so, Father, thank you. And I pray, God, that you will be a blessing. Keep everyone safe. Lord, we just come against every attack of the enemy that would try to destroy their faith this week. Because, Lord, you said, I'm praying for you. You said, I'm, I'm praying for you. And, Lord, let them know that you're praying for us. You're praying for them, and you're praying for me, and you're praying for all of us, Lord. And, Lord, we say we're looking forward to your coming back because only you, not the Republicans or the Democrats or Washington, D.C., can straighten out this mess. Only you can straighten it out. And we'll give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Fellowship with one another before you leave and say hello. God bless.